Do you want to hear the story of how Disney almost made Monster Inc. and Funny Nemo 2? Well, you're in luck. To infinity and beyond! It's the early 1990s. The Walt Disney Company and Michael Eisner, its CEO of the time, is running on a high. It's the beginning of what will soon be known as the first Disney animation renaissance because Disney fans love to give specific names to everything that they do. The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast had just released a super high acclaim, and the company is currently working on Aladdin. They're looking for the next big thing to help bring the company completely around from shambles, the Black Cauldron, and the total failure that Euro Disney left them in. Around the same time, computer and software company turned animation studio Pixar was struggling. Hard. They received an Academy Award for their short film, Tin Toy, but the company could not turn a profit, even after selling off most of the company's hardware operations and having to lay off some employees. Throughout it all the hardship, though, the company was hard at work at what would change the film industry forever. Toy Story. Eisner took interest, and he couldn't keep his hands away. And Steve Jobs, the leader of the once computer company, only saw dollar signs. And lo and behold, soon after, the House of Mouse contacted the heads of Pixar, and they formed a contract after being impressed with the early work shown for Toy Story even though at first they thought it would be a great direct-to-home video project. The contract was Pixar would be required to make three feature films for Eisner's company, and in turn Disney would pay for the production and the marketing of the film, and retain the licensing rights, total control of the marketing, characters, sequels, and a massive part of the revenue. What a deal. But Pixar got to make the movie they wanted and retained a small amount of the box office and home video sales which would actually be a huge revenue stream for them with the popularity of VHS and the rise of DVDs. While the company had been keeping the general public out of a loop of the new film, they did begin to carve a name for themselves in the industry by winning numerous technical Oscars. Fast forward to 1995. Everyone involved, Disney, Pixar, Eisner, and especially Steve Jobs, were all blown away with the massive success that came in late November with the release of Toy Story. The box office hall was massive, and the reviews were great. Pixar's, who once was a public company, stock rose insanely, from about $14 a share to around 22 and that generated about $600 million for Steve Jobs, who owned about 80% of Pixar. By the end of the year, Pixar was finally profitable, having around $23 million net income, numerous awards wins, and a stock that was worth around $50 a share. Cue the arrogance. Toy Story made history last year as the first computer-generated full-length feature film. The film earned over $192 million domestically, more than $300 million internationally. It will soon be released on home video. Its technology and success have revolutionized the business of animation and opened the door to endless possibility between Hollywood and the Silicon Valley. Around the same time, Apple Inc. was in big trouble. The company's co-founder went to the rescue, which left him in charge of both Apple, who recently ate up a lot of his other companies, and now an acclaimed film house. Per the Disney contract, Pixar was going to release A Bug's Life by the end of 1997, just two years after Toy Story. They achieved their goal, and Bug's Life went to beat Ants, The Prince of Egypt, and the Rugrat movie, both financially and with critical acclaim. To inflate the egos of everyone at Pixar just a little bit more, returns for the movie made everyone a lot richer. With two of the biggest recent animated movies under their belt, and so many technical and art Oscars that they can just give them away, and a ton of money in the piggy bank, Pixar went back to Disney to cut a better deal, and to screw over their future. The new deal that they came to was for Pixar to release five more future films. Bugs Life would be included in these. Disney would still own the characters and the licensing rights, but the two animation houses would be equal partners. But it's also a huge outlier on the contract. Pixar would sell 5% of the outstanding stock to Disney for $15 a share. This is important. Trust me, I wouldn't give you meaningless facts. The next time they would release would be Toy Story 2. It'd be extremely risky for both companies involved, mainly Disney, since it would only be the second theatrical sequel to one of their movies ever released. Rescuers and the Rescuers Down Under would be the first one. Disney had their own way of doing things, and the inflatedness of Pixar would not let that happen. There's also some very shady tactics used by the Walt Disney Company to make sure Pixar made another movie for them. Apparently making a sequel did not count towards Pixar's five-movie contract, but in the end it did and the overall film paid off for both parties, and continued the stream of profitability and critical acclaim for Pixar. Pixar would go on to make Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, and The Incredibles, and eventually work on Cars. All the characters in their sequels would be owned by Eisner, and this is where the tensions between the companies really started to heat up. In 2004, 
Pixar and their greediness, which was fueled by Steve Jobs, demanded that going forward, Pixar would only use Disney for distribution. They wanted to fund their own movies and only give Disney a 10-15% to industry standard distribution fee. They also wanted character and sequel freedom from The Incredibles and Cars. Eisner said no. Jobs, being the selfish man that he was, was not happy with that decision at all. But Cars would still be released to fulfill the original contract. And angry about how things have been dealt with, Pixar decided they'd go elsewhere for distribution. But spoiler, they actually never ended up producing a feature film away from Disney. And this is where Circle 7 animation finally comes in. Scared of losing the powerhouse of Pixar and making him seem like a worse CEO than he actually was, Eisner set up his own 3D animation house within Walt Disney Animation during his 2004 talks with Jobs. He was scared negotiations would fall through, which they did, which is how Circle 7 got made, who never released anything, but still has actual history that is in the Disney archives. Since Disney owned the characters and their sequel rights to the initial slate of Pixar films, Eisner thought it'd be a great idea to have another straight-to-DVD production house to make Toy Story 3, Monsters, Inc. 2, Lost in Scaradice, and Finding Nemo 2, just had he had with multiple Renaissance films. It would have been a perfect plan and would complement the massive box office success and critical darling of Home on the Range and Chicken Little, which was in pre-production. The new head of this division would be Andrew Milstein, who was the head of animation at Disney's MGM Studios, which was supposed to be the animation and film capital of the East. But it's now filled with different Star Wars stuff at Launch Bay, so I guess we can thank Milstein for so much Star Wars in our Disney parks. Eisner got the best in the business to start production on Toy Story 3. He sought the perfect team to write. Writers so well known that only one of them had a picture on IMDb. The writers of Love Boat. Yes, Love Boat. Bob Hilgenberg and Rob Muir. Apparently though, these were the wrong guys. When they pitched their Toy Story 3 idea, they were rejected outright. Even though they enjoyed it, they just wanted to go in a different direction. Disney had more than 30 different screenwriters pitch ideas for Toy Story 3. And I'll link an article down in the description which mentions some of them. Later, the writing duo came back and would be hired for Monsters, Inc. 2 because they were the only guys to pitch for it. But in the end, they actually did work heavily on Toy Story 2 rewrites because Disney was impressed with their monster script. And the script for Scared Eyes can actually be found floating around online, and it's pretty good. Also, as a side note, there are some really interesting pitch ideas from Bob and Rob, including them yelling at Eisner about Pirates of the Caribbean Fast Passes for Disneyland. It's in the same article I will link. During this time, those stockholders were getting really angry with Eisner. The total abomination that was Euro Disneyland, a lackluster string of animated films, and now losing Pixar, all culminated and led to Eisner not being re-elected to the board of directors, and ultimately sending him to retire from the position. But honestly, I'm okay with this move, even though he did save Disneyland, but then almost destroyed it. But mainly because he got a foothold in the company that now makes Bojack Horseman, so I'll let it slide. Soon, Iger came in to clean things up. One of the first things Iger did was start back negotiations with Steve Jobs about getting Pixar back on board to produce films with Disney. He also knew they shouldn't have two 3D animation studios, and second straight-to-home video studios since Disney Toon was still being used. But he was actually looking to do a little bit of shopping. He again set up some safety precautions in case Jobs wanted to be the wild type again. But Pixar did the same. Jobs announced that Pixar would no longer release films in November, but in the summer, for a bigger box office return, and to be able to sell more DVDs at Christmas. They also delayed cars until 2006 to make sure things went over smoothly. Iger helped create a one-picture distribution deal for the upcoming 2007 film Ratatouille, while negotiations were still going on. This is actually a distribution deal that Jobs wanted earlier that cost Eisner. Mr. Iger was just buttering up the company a little. None of this actually mattered, though. In 2006, Disney announced their acquisition with Pixar Animation through a $7.4 million stock deal, and having some stock already in the company helped pave the way for this. This also gave Jobs a 7% stake in the Walt Disney Company, the largest of any individual at the time, and gave him a seat on the board of directors. This also boosted Laster to become a creative director of both Pixar and Disney Animation, until later forced out by scandal, and then able to find job reasonably quickly afterwards. Because Hollywood. What about Circle 7 Animation? Well, in May of 2006, the division was officially shut down, and 80% of the employees were either taken in by Disney or Pixar, which meant about 32 people lost their jobs, and about a dozen of those were foreigners on visas. And Andrew Milstein? Well, he was appointed the general manager of Walt Disney Animation to deal with the day-to-day -day operations. Pixar would eventually go on to make semi-decent movies, besides Wally, e up the actual Toy Story 3, and Coco, which were all masterpieces. 
but still getting huge box office returns and decent reviews. The duos who rewrote the fake Toy Story film and Monsters, Inc. sequel will move the Disney tune and create success with the decent enough Tinkerbell films. I guess this whole story goes to show when two egoists meet, it's always an eye for an eye. Thanks for watching. You've got a friend in me.